chapter 15, part two, uh, reconstruction. So we left off with um, the white women in America not very happy about uh, the 15th Amendment not including them as, as voters. You're going to allow black men previously, or freed slaves, or I should say previous slaves that are freed to the vote, but not us. Um, so moving on with this idea of being freed, what, what exactly did it mean in this era of Reconstruction? So again, we, I mentioned in the first half, part of the Reconstruction process is to how to integrate these freed people into American society. How is that going to happen? What, what did black freedom really mean? Um, what happened to the slaves at the end of the war? <clears throat> Where did they go? There wasn't you know, exactly a welcoming committee. Congratulations, you're free. Come over. No, no one said anything. The Union troops came through that area and they were freed, but they didn't tell them where to go. They just were free. They're, they're on the same plantation, living in the same shack, but I don't have to work anymore. What do I do? Uh, well, it's interesting. The, the most popular choice for a free slave would be to go in search of, of family members that were sold away in the past. Children, spouses, parents, cousins, to, to reunite, to bring your family together. <clears throat> but they also want voting rights. And without those, you have no power. Uh, they want to build communities, start their lives, be, be real people. You know, when you were a slave, you didn't have last names. You, know, you, you kind of had like pet names. It was almost like a pet. You had names like Quilla and Moly and Cinder and Polly and Letty, Winnie, Cumby, Amos. <clears throat> They had no last names. So if you're going to integrate into American society, you've got to have a last name. And many of these freed slaves took the name of their master, okay? Because they didn't know any other name. We'll just take take our master's name. And, and now we'll be, you know, uh, Betty Johnson or whoever it might, might be. Many, many took names of famous people, such as Jefferson, in in Lincoln in Washington, so if you know you still find evidence of this in the in the black community today, many many black families have Washington and Jefferson in their as their last names. That came from taking that name. <clears throat> uh, an interesting celebrity from San Diego is a good example of this. So who who is this man right here? <clears throat> Does anybody know who this is? I can hear you. That's correct, Ladanian Tomlinson. So who's he? Also known as LT. Who is he? This is a pretty famous uh, football player in the NFL that played for the San Diego Chargers until uh, the last few couple of years of his career. Uh, you know, huge in the in the early 2000s. Uh, so Ladanian Tomlinson actually came from a very poor part of Texas and grew up in an area called Tomlinson Hill. Same last name. So he asked his mother, you know, why is, why is our name up there? And, and his mother said, your grandfather was instrumental in getting this community off the ground. So they named it after him. And that's what he always thought. So Ladanian goes through his life, pretty good athlete. And he, he goes to Texas Christian University uh, on scholarship, a runner up to the Heisman Trophy, the best college player in, in, the, in the nation. Uh, drafted in the first round by the San Diego Chargers, becomes a millionaire and, you know, comes from poverty, becomes a multi-millionaire football player. And he, he kind of transforms into LT, kind of the superhero, one, one, of the, one of the better running backs in the history of the National Football League. Uh, during his career, um, you, you know, again, he came from poverty. Now he's living in, in wealth. Uh, during his career, a man named Chris Tomlinson, same last name, but, but a white man. So they, they're not related biologically. Uh, Chris Tomlinson reaches out to Ladanian and says, Ladanian, next time you're in Texas, will you please meet me? I want to talk to you about a book I'm writing. <clears throat> it doesn't matter how wealthy or famous you are. If, if, you're a, if you're a man of color and a white man approaches you and says, I want to talk to you about something, you you are sus suspicious and you don't trust this man because you've, you've seen it your whole life. What does this white man want from me? Okay, but he decides to go and he meets Chris. Chris tells him about a book that Chris was writing called Tomlinson Hill, same name. The remarkable story of two families who shared the Tomlinson name, one white, one black. <clears throat> so perhaps you're starting <clears throat> to, it's starting to fall into place for you. 
uh, here are these two men going back to this place called Tomlinson Hill. It turns out Chris Thomason tells the Danian, no, that's not because of your grandfather. That is the name of the plantation that was here before the Civil War, named after my family, Tomlinson Hill. I am a descendant of the family that owned this plantation. Ladanian, your family are the descendants of the slaves who were enslaved on Tomlinson Hill. So, of course, this is a pretty frightening moment for Ladanian. Oh, my gosh, my last name is not a valid name. It's, a, it's, a, it's my master's name. I don't, I don't know if I want this. And he, and he struggles with this, and he has a tough time. You know, trying trying to figure out you know how how do I how do I do this, but as you'll see in this next film, he comes to terms with it. So as his career, when a when an NFL player's career comes to an end, after five years of being retired, they're eligible for the Hall of Fame. Of course, you have to have you know big stats statistics to get in the Hall of Fame. Not just everybody gets in the Hall of Fame; only a handful do. And Ladanian was a first ballot Hall of Famer, meaning that he got in on his first try. So when you, when, you, when you become a Hall of Famer, they have a ceremony before the start of each season where all the new Hall of Famers come and get their, get their induction. They have a bus that's put in the hall, and they give an acceptance speech. And some of these have become very emotional over, you know, over the years, uh, but mostly thanking everyone that helped them along their way. But some use it for a political you know, uh, platform for, for a cause. Uh, so Ladanian's speech went along like most you know, thanking everybody, players, family, parents, coaches that helped him. But at the end of the speech, he kind of changes directions and he starts talking about what I'm talking about, about finding out about his family. So let's go to a film here. Please watch the film entitled Ladanian Tomlinson, NFL HOF 2017. Go ahead and watch that and come on back. <clears throat> so, that, but, wow, that that's pretty powerful. And like I said, there's been a lot of memorable Hall of Fame speeches by these big men that are up there crying their eyes out about how thankful they are. But this is considered to be one of the best. This this will stand the test of time based on the timing of it all. 2017, in the midst of all the racial strife going on, Charlotte's Village just happened. You know, around that same time, uh, you have a racial strife in the streets. So so this was this was a telling moment. And here's this football player you know, imploring people, come together, be on the same team. We can do it together. Don't fight against each other. And, of course, it brings to mind the words of Martin Luther King. I'm sorry, these two men coming together like this brings to mind the words of Martin Luther King in his I Have a Dream speech of 1963. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Here they are. So this is an example of hopefully progress. This is a white man who understands his his past, that you know, a racist family that owned people, but he's come to terms with it. And he approaches the Ladanian, the enslaved, the, the descendant from the enslaved, and they come together and they, and they deal with it. Okay. Uh, so this 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 all this all relates to our our reconstruction era. I'm I'm actually gonna gonna use Ladanian as an example of something else here in a few minutes. But so here's an example of a famous person today, wh wh whose name came from their former ancestor slave owner, their their master. So so what happens to these freed people? No money, no skills, no education, but but more importantly, no opportunity. Southern whites were not going to give them anything. Mm -hmm. So Sherman, during Sherman's march, as he liberated areas, hundreds and thousands of slaves followed him, because where else are they going to go? Follow the follow the great emancipator. And he promised them that after the war, the government would give each slave 40 acres and a mule to work the land. Where is that 40 acres going to come from? F from the former plantation lands. And Sherman promised this. <clears throat> when, when, uh, when Lincoln found out about this, he got very angry. Why, how could you promise that? I can't promise that. So this never came to fruition. So 40 acres and a mule today stands as a slogan for a, another broken promise. You know, you, you, you told us you're going to help us out, but you didn't. You know, the government said they'd step up, but they didn't. So this is 
used derogatorily today to, of course, give an example of, of you know, government uh, dishonesty. In fact, if you know Spike Lee is, Spike Lee, pretty famous director, directs and, and writes movies about the African American experience today. Uh, his production company is named 40 Acres and a Mule. Of course, you know, taking a taking a, a, a dig at this idea that came up came up uh, uh, along after the Civil War. <clears throat> so back to our radical Republicans, Thaddeus Stevens was the, was the leader, and he felt that all these plantations would be split up into smaller parcels and given to its former slaves, 40 acres and a mule. What do you think about that? Divide up the plantations. These are opulent homes. Some were thousands of acres. These people were very, many of them, most of them very, very wealthy, manicured lives. They, they lived off the backs, the labor of the backs of, of their slaves. But many were born into this and didn't know any better. And should they be, you know, thrown aside, cast aside and taken all their lands? Of course, it's easy to say from looking at from today, the lens of today, looking backward, well, yes, it's fair because they enslaved people. And you know you could you could you could make that that social argument that you know is 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 that a uh, that's an awful thing. But understand something, okay? Before the Civil War in the South, it was not illegal. This was the laws that they had. It's okay to enslave people. It's okay to abuse them. It's okay to beat them up, rape them, lynch them, hang them, stab them, do whatever you want to them, okay? Overwork them, work them to death. It's it's part of it. Uh, but there's no law against any of that. So is this fair? Uh, th this, this whole thing came to, to be a moot point because President Johnson finally allowed ex-Confederates to get all their lands back, including the plantations and the thousands of acres, and that took away any opportunity for the slaves. The slaves had no opportunities to gain their own land. So without question, the lack of land that was available to former slaves <clears throat> left them with little opportunities. So what did they do? How, how did they get through? You know, what, what did they do to survive? Well, a, a system came along that, that changed everything. So looking at this picture, using the word association game, what is the first word that comes to your mind when you glance this picture? Most people say, slavery or a slave. And that's not correct. This is actually a sharecropper. This is a freed man. This is a this is a this is a young black man after the war, after his freedom. He doesn't look very free to me, but he's no longer a slave. He's a sharecropper. <clears throat> so what is sharecropping? Well this is work for former slaves that gave them work and opportunities. Who's giving them the work? their former masters in many cases because they needed the labor force. So these two groups of people that, that you know, master and slave for many hundreds of, de many decades, a couple hundred years or more, uh, the Civil War made them split apart. But as they both, both, both parties realized we don't have any opportunity without the other, the white plantation owner can't get any crops planted and harvested without labor. And the, the freed, uh, freed men and women don't have any opportunity. So they come back together. Uh, and it seemed like initially that this is a pretty good deal. This actually helps both people, both groups. And maybe this is a good thing. You know, both groups are getting what they want. But as we'll see, like, like most other things, selfishness, greed, dishonesty, part of the human nature, it comes in. We'll see here how sharecropping only created a system of endless indebtedness. And this was one of the failures of the Reconstruction era I mentioned before. Uh, sharecropping trapped a sharecropper, a freed man, into a cycle of poverty that, that many couldn't get out of for generations. So, so what is this idea of sharecropping? How does it work? <clears throat> so this, this is the sharecropping cycle of poverty, six steps. Number one at the top. Sharecropper, the ex-slave, is provided land and seed by the owner of the plantation, perhaps his previous master. Uh, the master gives him land and seed in exchange for living there and working the land. The sharecropper promises the landowner half the crop. 
So that doesn't sound so bad. If I get half the crop, I'll be making some money. I've never made money in my life. So it, it's, it seems like a win-win for the sharecropper, the, the former slave. <clears throat> But the sharecropper says, but, you know, I don't have any money. I have no food, clothing, blankets, medicine. I have a family. What about that? The sharecrop, the, I'm sorry, the owner says you can buy that for me on credit. Well, that sounds pretty good. So the sharecropper plants the seeds, harvests the crop, number three, number four. Uh, you know, the harvest is in. The sharecropper gives the landowner all the crop to sell, knowing that he'll get half the earnings, minus the cost of his purchases for the year in number two. But still, I didn't spend that much money. So, so just, just for, for example, for clarity, let's just say that the sharecropper's crop was worth $1,000. He gives it to the owner. The owner is then going to go to the market and come back with $1,000. He's going to keep $500 and give the sharecropper $500, right? But up in, up in number two, just for a figure, let's say the sharecropper spent $200, on food and supplies, clothing, medicine, so on. So, of course, I'm going to deduct that $200. I, I owe you three, okay? The sharecropper is happy. I've never had money in my life, $300, and this is great. This is, And next year, I don't need as much supplies. We'll make more money. But number five is where it all comes undone. When settling up, the landowner says that the sharecropper owes more than he has earned. What? What are you talking about? Well, back in number two, what, this, what the owner didn't tell the sharecropper is you're buying food from me on credit, but I'm going to charge you an exorbitant amount of interest. Interest? What's interest? To a, to a former slave with no education and no concept of math and never had anything like that. Interest compounded and all of that doesn't have make any sense to them. And, of course, they feel kind of stupid. We don't know what this man's talking about, but he, all they know is that the owner doesn't owe me money. I owe them money because my 300 with, or the 200 that I borrowed with interest is, is now 400. So instead of getting three, I owe him $100. I've worked the entire season and I owe him $100. I don't get anything. Number six, to pay the debt, the sharecropper must promise the landowner a greater share of next year's crop. So here you see the cycle you can't get out of. It keeps going year after year after year. There are many people in the South, and not just not just black families today. If you've ever been down the Mississippi Delta, the deep South, driving in the back roads, and I have, it looks like 1860, 1855, let's say there. You have lots of impoverished looking, typically black workers, but again, many white workers today also out there picking cotton with these long bags just as they did back in the day. Uh, in the middle, the, the, the uh, copy there in the middle, by the time the sharecroppers had shared their crops and paid their debts, they rarely had any money left. Often they were uneducated, not often, always they were uneducated, and could not argue with landowners or merchants who cheated them. What's interest? We don't know what interest is. How do you argue? So sharecropper frequently became tied to one plantation. That's the key to sharecropping. A sharecropper and his family became tied to one plantation decade after decade, generation after generation, having no choice but to work until his debts were paid. Okay, so this is awful. This still goes on today. A sharecropper is paid by, uh, by the crop. Uh, so it's got nothing to do with minimum wage. But when it's all said and done, a sharecropper today in our times right now makes far, far less than minimum wage, but it's, it's just structured that way and, and they get away with it. Uh, so by 1890, three out of four former slaves were sharecroppers, 75%. Hear what I'm saying, 25 years after the Civil War. That's not very long. 75%, three out of four people that were freed we're back in the fields working as sharecroppers, looking just like this man right here. So I mentioned Ladanian Tomlinson, and that I use him as, as an example. And I don't mean to pick on LT, but he's a good example of a couple of things. Not just the last name, but also an example of sharecropping. Ladanian grew up on the same lands that his, his uh, descendants were um, slaves on. Okay, I should say ancestors were, were slaves on. Uh, his family's still there. They've never been able to escape Tomlinson Hill. They're still there 160-something years after this war. 
Ladini escaped because he was an athlete, but his family, cousins, are still there working the land. So sharecropping was seen as an efficient method to raise cotton and for former plantation owners to exploit the freed slaves because we don't want to integrate them. We don't want to give them opportunity. We don't want equality. We want to hold them, press our thumbs down them like we always have. Uh, the lash of indebtedness was always on their back. Maybe we can't whip them anymore or we can't do what we did, but, but debt is almost as bad, okay? So again, 25 years after the war, you can begin to understand why we still have racism and discrimination in this country. This, this went on for, well, like I said, it still goes on, but abuse of African-American people after the war went on for 100 years. Uh, Civil War did not solve their problems. It, in many ways, it made them worse. So at this point in American history, you know, we're almost th in, talking about this era. We're almost 300 years into it, and African Americans are still trying to find freedom. Even after this war was fought to give it to them, they still don't get it. So race, like I said, is the common thread through all of American history, even today. So, so what happened to Reconstruction? How did it fail? What were the consequences? Well, you know, initially there had been a period right after the war during the early Reconstruction era when blacks could vote, and they did, and black officials were lucky for the first time. This image here is entitled The First Colored Senator and Representatives. These are the first congressmen in American history that were black. Black communities were built around a central church. They created schools, newspapers. They integrated themselves into a productive community. Always separate from the white communities, though, always segregated. But slowly at first, the ex Confederates started to regain control. And they implemented a second kind of slavery for the freed blacks, exploited through sharecropping, legally segregated, uh, black codes to take away their, their rights that the, the, that the three Reconstruction Amendments gave them. Uh, and again, kept apart from white society. You're not integrating with us. They did not accept Republican governments, Reconstructionist governments in the South. They wanted to reestablish a society like they had before the war. So even 100 years at the Civil War, interracial marriages were against the law in most states, most certainly all the southern states. That was finally struck down by the Supreme Court when I was a teenager. It's not that far back. This is all a long time ago, but does it relate to us today? You know, should we get over the past? You know, it's, it still reverberates because it's handed down each generation. And this is the idea of what, we, what you hear of as systemic or institutionalized racism. It's built into the system. When everybody goes along because it's all we know, okay? Uh, these, these, these racist moments from the 60s and 70s are still with us because of this systemic racism. And I'm sure we all have our own stories about uh, wh whatever color you are, and they're all going to be different stories based on that. But, but even as a white person, you see this. And of course, as a young white person growing up in a town that told me that I should be afraid of these people, you know, it's a, it's an education in itself. It's, it's, it's an enlightenment that happens slowly. It, it's a it's a slow process, but you start to see what you're living in and what you're growing up around, and you determine to turn your back on. And at least that's that's what I do. But but I mean, we all have our stories. I could tell you a couple of stories, um, you know, of just ones that stick out to me, um, where where racism slapped me in the face, not for the same reasons that it would slap a a, a person of color in the face, but where I I just kind of came to attention. Wow, look at that! I this is what this really is. One of those was was a, a job I had. After high school, I worked for a, a, a market, pretty famous market even today. Uh, and I was lucky to become part of the management team pretty early. I was probably 18, 19 years old. And uh, my uh, my supervisor, the manager of the store's name was Nolan. He was a great guy, one of, one of the great guys, which is, you know, un, it's not unusual for a great guy to be a rabid racist. And that's what he was. So he was training me on how to uh, uh, give interviews and you know for for jobs to hire people, and he said, you know, "Here's the questions. Ask this, and just you know write your name and blah blah blah." But if it's a black person, um, I always put a little N at the top of the page, a little N, 
because his name was Nolan. So if anybody asked him what's the N for, he would say, oh, that's because I did the interview. Of course, all the white people he interviewed didn't have an N on it, just the black people did, because N didn't stand for Nolan. It stood for the N-word. He wanted to be able to go back in his file and see not him, not her, not him, because they've got that N. I mean, I was absolutely appalled. I couldn't believe this nice man uh, who'd give you the shirt of his back. You know, for me or my family, my girlfriend, whatever it was, he was a great guy. But yet here he is saying, I've got this intense hatred for these people. And I'm not going to hire them. Uh, that was one of my wake up moments for me to that this is wrong. You know, another story, one of my best friends, um, his family, they, they had they were Italian, they had a big family and they would come together and, and do a lot of uh, entertaining. Um, we played bocce ball, it was so much fun. Anyway, um, uh, his his sister um, was younger, still in high school, and she was dating another kid in her guy in her class, who wanted to become a police officer. And so, so this couple kind of grew up. You know, I watched them grow up, and this you know this this guy became a police officer. He started as an explorer. He'd drive around in a little light blue shirt. And he used to he used to brag to his girlfriend about I gave out. 10 tickets today to people that had for sale signs in their car. I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? It's against the law to put a for sale sign in your car because it, as a, as a person is driving by, it attracts their attention. They might look to try to read the sign and crash. I mean, it's like spitting on the sidewalk. It's like jaywalking. I mean, I get it. It's against the law, but people do it and nobody cares. But this guy, I wrote up 10 tickets trying, trying to brag. So yeah, you might start to get an indication of the guy's character here. So the years go by, and these two get married, and the young boy, young man, becomes a full-fledged police officer for the town I grew up in. Uh, and years later, many years later, probably in the mid-'80s or somewhere around there, um, I, I went back to one of my friend's parents' you know, parties, and there he was. And I walked up with other people, and of course he's telling. Of course he's a veteran now, and he's telling people stories about being a cop and just kind of basking in the glow, right? And everyone was all excited to hear. And then he said, "You know, none of you have anything to worry about in this town. We've got you covered." And I said, "What do you mean by that?" He said, "Well, you know, this is a small town. There's like a lot going on. We don't have, you know, bank robberies and." and you know hot pursuits every night so a lot of what we do we just patrol and we patrol the perimeter of this town the, the town i grew up in was indeed a covenant town and we talked about that before in this class to, to keep black people away from buying homes in that community only white people that's the town town i grew up in um and uh he said um we we uh, we patrol the perimeter of the town and any time an hispanic black anybody that's not white, if they cross into the city limits, we pull them over, we harass them, we try to arrest them, we do what we can to ruin their lives, and uh, the, the least we do is, is kick them out and tell them not to come back. This is the early 80s, mid 80s, guys. This is not 1911. This is, this is 1985, 6, 7, you know, happening in a, a little town in Los Angeles, not Birmingham, Los Angeles, okay? Uh, and I said, you know, like, you, you can't, like, are you kidding? You can't do that. That's, that's against the law. That's, that's, that's the height of racism. We got in an argument and, uh, you know, he, he kind of stood his own and some of my friends agree with him. That's right. I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're doing that. I'm happy to hear that you're keeping these people out. Not that long ago. What, what's relevant about this story is it doesn't, I mean, it kind of ends there as far as I'm concerned. I didn't, I don't think I've seen him since. I think I saw him at a funeral a few years ago, but kind of, you know, waved at each other. I didn't talk to him. But what's interesting about this, this particular man, this, this young boy who became a cop <clears throat> today, he has risen through the ranks in that town. And he is today, as we speak today, the chief of police in that town. OK, this is how systemic racism continues. You know, you learn it as, as as a young person 30, 40 years ago. It's still with you. It's still with you. You rise to the ranks. You finally get a position of authority and you bring it back and you start to train all your your force. Be like me. Do it this way. 
don't give people of color the same uh, you know courtesy you give white people why do we have so so much problem with police this could be a big part of it now I'm gonna be devil's advocate here I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a break because I don't know I, I I haven't talked to him in a long long time <clears throat> I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because I can tell you that you can't become the chief of police without some advanced education. I would think at least a master's degree, okay? I don't think you have to have a doctorate, but perhaps you, you could. So I, I know what the education process did for me. You know, it enlightened me when I was young, like, wow. And I mentioned in this class before about how the greatest generation brought their kids up in this kind of fairy tale land of suburbs and we thought life was just father knows best right and then of course we get older and start going to college and, and this Vietnam War and all and we look and oh my gosh the, the real world's different out here you know same same type of thing but anyway get back to back to the the, the guy um, the chief of police I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that his educational experience enlighten him also that perhaps today he's not he's no longer a racist like he was uh, and and hopefully he's running that city that way okay okay so back to our story of the failures of reconstruction mm -hmm. okay so the radical Republicans started pushing for a civil rights bill and they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1875 guaranteeing African Americans equal treatment in public accommodations, public transportation, uh, to prohibit them from being excluded from jury service, and also transportation and public accommodations to become a juror. Sounds great. <clears throat> What's significant about that? Again, really nothing. Because the South just said we're not going to enforce that. They, they found ways to circumvent it. And they continued to oppress uh, and discriminate torture and murder black people again for nearly a hundred years before it was finally stopped. So what happened to Reconstruction? Well it starts with the, the, the downfall, the end of Reconstruction started with a worldwide economic depression called the Panic of 1873. Of course money dries up, the economy is dead. Uh, this severely curtailed the Republicans plans for Reconstruction. It takes money to rebuild the South. Uh, the government in moments like this take on a different kind of approach. It's called laissez-faire. Uh, do what you want. Would leave us out of it. Kind of hands off. <coughs> Let the businesses do what they want. Uh, and of course, social programs just fall by the wayside. So programs designed to help the freed slaves, ex-slaves in the South, just dry up, and they're on the streets with nobody to defend them. Uh, and at the same time, the government, and I'm referring to Ulysses Grant's administration, were corrupt in drowning scandals. In fact, Ulysses Grant's administration is considered to be perhaps the most corrupt uh, administration in American history. The Credit Mobilier scandal in 1872 was taking everybody's time up. Then the panic comes, and people don't have time for reconstruction anymore. So Credit Mobilier... <clears throat> was a scam that involved the Transcontinental Railroad uh, getting government grants and pocketing much of it. <clears throat> so the money dries up. <clears throat> this put the Republicans in disarray. The, the Depression shook everybody, much like what happened to us in 2008, if you're old enough to remember that. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of person you are. You could be a liberal that, that promotes social programs and, and, you, and you donate money and all these things, but when your house when you can't pay for your house, you can't pay for your car, you can't put food on the table for your kids, you, you, you become worried about your own survival, not social programs. <clears throat> and that's what happened here. And the Northerners, by this time, were tired of Reconstruction, and they wanted to move on from the Civil War era. Uh, you know, it's been uh, seven, eight years before this, this era has been going on. Let's move on. The rest of the world is deeply involved in the Industrial Revolution, mass production, drop in the prices, uh, more items for people. Let's, let's do that and forget about the people in the South, especially the freed slaves that don't have anywhere to go. So this, allowed the, so this disinterest allowed the Southerners to further regain control. And I mentioned black codes, the, these you know, laws to hold blacks back 
and return them to the fields. Ill illegal laws, state laws that were unconstitutional, but again, nobody stopped them, nobody enforced them. So they have they have uh, things called poll taxes, where it, if you were a black man and you wanted to vote, it cost you money. Well, it doesn't say anywhere in the Constitution that it costs you money to vote, but that's what they did in the South post-war. Black men were charged money to vote. Black men didn't have money. They, they had been slaves. They don't have any money. The other one was uh, uh, a literacy test. You have to pass a test to see if you're literate to vote. So, again, look in the Constitution. It doesn't say you have to be smart, that you have to be literate. You don't have to be any of those things today or then to vote, but but they force black men to take these literacy tests. Well, here's the thing: it isn't that you can't get through this this test? It, it's most of it is just logic. But understand, you understand logic because you have an education. These people didn't. They didn't understand what logic meant. So this this was something that they could not get through. Look at number seventeen. I'm sorry, that's not the right one. Uh, look at number 15. In the space below, write the word noise backwards and place a dot over what would be its second letter should it have been written forward. Okay, I mean, we could figure that out, but this was challenging for, you know, uh, illiterate black men. Uh, and look at the numbers there, 23. Now, I don't know if there's more pages or not, even if it, even if it ends right there. Imagine having to do even just 23 of these. It would take you forever and very difficult. Against the law, unconstitutional, but they got away with it. Nobody stopped them. The other one was the grandfather clause. What's that? If your grandfather was a free man, you could vote. Well, of course, a newly freed uh, slave, a black male man, of course his grandfather was a slave too, so he couldn't vote. Again, illegal, unconstitutional. But the disinterest by the North allowed the KKK to rise even even more so, and really dig in, and they intimidate blacks from voting, do whatever they can do to to frighten blacks from voting because that way white supremacy will reign, okay? Uh, and what they want to do, the, the Ku Klux Klan, the, the redemptioners, they want to redeem the Old South, they want to overthrow the Republican Reconstructionist governments. And they used intimidation tactics against the law. But nobody stopped them. And they retook control while the North was looking the other way. And they returned to the South to one that was based on white supremacy again, even after the war was over that freed them. <clears throat> uh, the Republicans lost much from the Depression, including support, lost half the representatives in the in the House, and the Democrats gained control. Uh, a couple terms from your book, slaughterhouse cases. These were Supreme Court. These are cases where the Supreme Court diminished civil rights legislation. So this, these are court. These are cases that have been passed, that have been approved in the past, but are now being diminished. One of them, U.S. versus Crookshank, a case that involved the murders of blacks in Louisiana, but. Somehow in this case, the Supreme Court ruled that each state could decide who has voting rights. I mean, really? And how could they do this? The Constitution holds precedence over the states. The Constitution said that all men could vote, regardless of color. But yet here, states are saying not in our state. So they're, they're trumping the Constitution illegally. And the cherry on top was the election of 1876, tainted with controversy, Rutherford B. Hayes. Republicans gave Rutherford B. Hayes the electoral votes from the three remaining states still under Republican rule, three states that had not come back into the Union yet, Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina. This amounted to 20 electoral votes, and that was enough to give him the election. So Hayes was elected. So it was agreed, Hayes agreed before the election, if you give me these votes illegally, he in return would withdraw all the troops still in the South. Okay, all of them would be withdrawn. Uh, and Reconstruction would be officially over. Uh, please watch the film entitled The Compromise of 1877. 
and then come on back. So he received the votes from three states that had not reached the Union yet, giving him the election. So Reconstruction is over. It was an absolute failure. And the failure was caused by violence that crushed black aspirations and the abandonment by northern whites of southern Republicans. So the abandonment by northern whites of southern Republicans. Who's a southern Republican? Freed slave. Because there weren't any Republicans in the South because it was the Republican Party that, that you know, uh, uh, was against slavery. So uh, the northern whites turned their backs on the freed slaves and left them to their own devices left in the hands of their former slave owners. And for 90 more years, the South fell into a society based on racism, discrimination, and oppression. This is what we call the Jim Crow South. <clears throat> the name of the racial caste system that operated in the southern border states. Jim Crow laws were statutes in enacted by southern states. <clears throat> Legalized segregation between Ameri African Americans and whites that went on up into the 1960s. Uh, Restricted use of public facilities, bathrooms, drinking fountains, schools, the vote, <clears throat> finding, <clears throat> excuse me, finding decent employment. <clears throat> it excluded African Americans from exercising their rights as citizens of the United States, as provided them in the Constitution and especially the three Reconstruction Amendments. And the, the Jim Crow laws were really more than a series of rigid anti-black laws. It was a way of life. Under Jim Crow, black people, former slaves, were, were relegated to the status of second-class citizens. Jim Crow represented the legitimization of anti-black racism that we still see vestiges of today. Christian ministers in this era taught, taught that whites were the chosen people and blacks were cursed to be their servants. They also taught that God himself supported racial segregation. Uh, they broke many laws, they ignored the Reconstruction Amendments, but again, nobody stopped them. And once the, once the removal of federal troops was done, all the gains uh, the newly freed slaves had made came to an end and left to their own device to defend themselves against the former Confederate white Southerners who hated them and wanted to re-enslave them and who took recontrol who took who retook control of the south uh, regardless of the three amendments and other laws and we've mentioned a few uh that in, that was intended to ensure freedom and equality for the freed slave this is an important aspect of the lost cause that we've talked about briefly before uh it's an important aspect of our society and culture today the civil war is not some long ago irrelevant incident that has no impact on our society today. It still reverberates loudly. <clears throat> it's still being fought. The war itself legally freed the slaves, but it did not result in racial equality, as I mentioned a few times, as the re three Reconstruction Amendments claimed. Uh, it's not required, but at this point, if you'd like, um, there's a film entitled Why is the South Obsessed with the Civil War? And it is about 20 minutes long, but it goes into this, you know, deeper into this idea of the lost cause, a very interesting uh, kind of idea here. Okay, so of course, after a war is fought and the slaves are free, but they're re-enslaved illegally, sharecropping and so on, it's pretty hard not to ask the question, who really won the Civil War? Were the slaves ever freed? Uh, I mentioned 100 years. So it wouldn't be until 1960s, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that finally ended Jim Crow in the South. So again, Civil War ends in 1865. You have a 12 year period of strife reconstruction that ends with the Jim Crow South and the North turns their back. So from, from the, from the, 1870s to 1965, you have the Jim Crow South. Again, this is part of my lifetime. I was I was alive when this was still going on. Uh, so the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 65, gave uh, the black community access to voting, especially the Voting Rights Act. If you, if you read the paragraph at the bottom, 
It authorized the Attorney General to send federal examiners to register qualified voters by bypassing local officials who tried to keep blacks from voting, by, bypassing local officials that, of course, were the KKK. Put an end to that. We're going to look at the voter registration, uh, you know, uh, roles here. And if, if, a, if, a, if the black community is underrepresented in your community, we're going to come and investigate it. So put an end to it. Uh, not, not that it was so just over. We're, we're still trying to get through it. But this is a big, big moment in civil rights. This, this is perhaps is the moment. These two acts changed everything. But so since 1965, how many years is that? 50, 60 years. That's, 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 the, that's the true amount of time that the African-American community has had access to their freedoms. Of course, many would argue that they still don't have access and, and we see it in the streets uh, all the time. Uh, so the civil rights movement that's synonymous with the 1960s, what are they trying to do? They're trying to give the rights to black people in the 1960s, 50s, 60s, trying to give the rights to black people that the Civil War era had already given them 80, 90 years earlier. So, you know, again, why do we study history? Most people don't know this. The injustices of the Reconstruction era created the modern civil rights movement. So remember, Lincoln's gone, and with him went his kind, forgiving, and benevolent approach. Uh, but the result was, after all the arguments between politicians and all the back and forth, the in the end, the North just gave up and pulled out, leaving the freed slaves at the mercy of the Southern white supremacists. And I mentioned this election, it remains one of the most contentious and controversial presidential elections in American history. Uh, the results of the election remained among the most disputed ever. So we're talking about things that happened past our class. We're, we're 100 years past our class, but you have to know this to know how it all comes together and why we have strife in the streets today, okay? Uh, you know, how, how do we relate this class and specifically this chapter to our modern times? Well, Black Lives Matter is a good example of what I'm talking about. People don't understand what they're trying to say with their name. They're not saying we matter and you don't. They're saying, hey, America, wake up, we matter. Because for most of American history, they didn't. And, and we've seen that in this class. Black people that didn't have any rights to speak of until 1965. Okay, not that long ago. Now, as we move into the second, into, into a new millennium, you're having a, you know, a, a number of police-related shootings of young black men. It seems like they don't matter again. It seems like it was back in the, in the, antebellum era, the Jim Crow South. We can do what we want with them. They don't matter. That's where the name came from. We do matter. We matter also. They're not saying that nobody else doesn't matter. They're simply saying that we matter and we've earned that, okay? Okay, this brings us to the end of the instruction part of our class. So in this class, we've come a distance. We learned the story of how the English colonies began. They fought a revolution to gain independence. They fought a civil war to, allegedly anyway, solve the problem of slavery and achieve racial equality. Not exactly. Have we accomplished this? Do we live in a racially equal society today? We talked about this idea of access to opportunity. Does everyone have the same access to that that everyone else has even today? Or is it still based on the color of a person's skin? So as an instructor in my classes, my purpose from my perspective is to tell you the real story, no matter the thorns, not to promote one group or another, just to tell you the truth. This is how it really happened. So you can better understand the present because we're a reflection of those deeds of the past. You know, history did not begin with each of our lives. You know, the incidents that happened today have been building up for years, decades, centuries before we were even here. So it's important as you gain an education, and this is part of being educated, that to learn to understand that there's two sides to an argument. In a free country, we have to allow the other side to express themselves, even though perhaps we don't like it. Doesn't matter. 
free country, they have that right as long as they don't break the law and hurt somebody. Uh, many times we see in, in history or even just in, in the current news, a person or a group that lashes out and, and, and they're judged harshly. What is wrong with that with these people? Why are they doing that? But many times they have an historical reason to do that. It doesn't mean it's right or justifiable, but it's an indication of a heightened anxiety and frustration that these people uh, have. Okay, like the, we keep trying, we keep trying, we keep trying, we're plugging away, plugging away. We never get through to you people. We're looking to have access to the same rights that you have. So many times you have these conflicts, okay? Um, I, I also like to teach my students that, that we are connected to the past by different eras. Uh, you know, in this in this class, we talked about you know the the uh, we we went back to the start of time, start of humans. We went through the colonial era and the revolution. You know, we we keep coming forward. Antebellum, uh, the Civil War. You know, all these all these eras link together, based on events that happen with, within each one. Each one has an event that happens that that, that jump starts the next one. Okay. Uh, so I realize that that most of you are not history majors. So it's not important for your future to know all the details and facts of American history. But understanding how America has developed will give you more of an insight into the psyche of the country that you live in and, and maybe be a benefit to you as you attempt to navigate through it. Okay, that is the end of chapter 15. That is the end of the instruction portion of the class. So thank you very much for taking the class. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly have, and I hope to see many of you again in some of my future classes. Thank you. Take care.